بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الفيروسات الفاتحه 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 الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين الحمد لله في ان شاء الله نشتغل في توقيف فيزيتينغ ذا سيك اظن من سيك بيتابل سيك مان نوت هيلثي بيبل visiting the sick people okay now of course we all know that to visit the sick among our muslim brothers is a duty meaning it is obligatory it is not a sunnah it is obligatory it is a duty yeah based on the hadith i have brought brought with me a few book on hadith Because I don't want to write the hadith. They are long ones. So let me read the hadith. The first hadith that I want to read is from Abu Hurairah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bukhari and Muslim. I don't want to read the, the text. It is quite long. The meaning. Abu Hurairah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Allah said. Verily, Allah has been exalted and glorious will say on the day of resurrection. This is a very well-known hadith. Very well-known. On the day of resurrection, Allah will say, O son of Adam. In other words, Allah will ask each of the one of them. O son of Adam, I was ill, but you did not visit me. What would he say? The son of Adam will say, O oh my Lord, O oh my Rab, how could I visit you and you are the Rab of the world? You are the Lord of the world. You are Allah. How can I visit you? Or how can you be sick? Then he will say, Allah will say, Thereupon he will say, Did you not know that such and such a slave of mine was ill, but you did not visit him? In other words, you know that there was somebody who is ill among you and yet you do not visit him. To me, what it means is according to the scholars, this means that it is a duty. It is no more a sunnah. It is no more an encouragement. But the moment you hear that there is a Muslim brother or sister who is ill, then it is your duty to visit him. Right? It is your duty to do it. Otherwise, Allah will not ask you. Did you not realize that if you had visited him, you would have known that I was aware of your visit to him, for which I would reward you? In other words, it is not something that you go for free. You go with a reward. You would have found me with him. That was Allah will be with the person who is not well. He will. He will count yet. He will be finding me with him. O son of Adam. Another question. I asked food from you, but you did not feed me. He would submit. The, the son of Adam would say, My Rabb, how could I feed you? And you are the Rabb of the world. Allah would say, Did you not know that such and such a slave of mine asked you for food, but you did not feed him? The people ask you something, ask from you something, you have to feed. It is a duty, it becomes a duty. It's no more like, you know, whether I want to give or I don't want to give. It's not an option at all. If they ask you, you have to give. Even if it is just a date. Third one, did you not realize that if you had 
fed him, you would certainly have found his reward in me. O son of Adam, the third question, I asked water from you, but you did not give it to me. You will say, my rub, how could I give you water? And you are the rub of the world. Thereupon he will say, such and such a slave of mine asked you for water to drink, but you did not give it to him. Did you not realize that if you had given him to drink, you would have found his reward with you? This is a hadith from Muslim. It is not, it is not da'if, it is not hasan, it is very strong hadith. Very well known hadith. So that's the first hadith I want to read, which actually shows that it becomes a duty for us to visit the sick people. Okay? What normally happens is, if it is one of our relatives, then we would bother to go and visit. But if it is our neighbor, and he's not related to us, he's just our neighbor, we don't bother. Here, from here, it shows that if it is your neighbor, you still have peace. Uh, even if it is not related to you. That's one lesson that we have to learn to learn. Right? As committed Muslim, do not undervalue the great reward from Allah. Because if you visit the sick, Allah is with him. In other words, it is all blessing. When you walk towards the person who is sick, for example, you walk towards the hospital, you are actually wading the water of mercy, according to another hadith. You are wading the water of mercy. As long as you are with the sick person, you are in mercy of Allah. You are in the mercy of Allah. We know that, for example, most of us would like to go to Umrah or Hajj. Umrah is fresh because you go anytime. Because you want to make your supplication, you want to make dua. Of course, Makkah, Medina, and so on is place of where the dua or the supplication will be answered. Right? But do you realize that even by visiting the sick, your your supplication will be answered? Because it is a place of mercy. This is very important for us to realize. If we know that this is what is the reward for us, then we shall not feel that it is something that is difficult for us. We should be very encouraged, very inspired to actually be good. I'll go through the details later. That's number one. Okay. Second one, how do you pray for the sick? Prayers of, for the sick. There are so many prayers, but I would like to go through, sorry, before that. The Prophet Wasallam used to visit almost everybody who is sick or over sick. For example, he visited a Badwin. He visited a Badwin. According to the Hadith, Ibn Abbas reported the Prophet ﷺ visited a Badwin who was sick. Whenever he visited an ailing person, whenever the Prophet ﷺ visited an ailing person, a, a sick person, he would say, La ba'sa taburru insha Allah. No harm to be for you. More for, for your purification. From sins. If Allah did it. This is what Allah says. This is what he says. If he goes and visit anyone, he will say, no harm, there is no harm. To be sick is not really a big harm, right? but it is one way of Allah expiating your sins. Right? So, the Badwin also was visited. Another case, a Jewish boy who used to be helping the the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu to prepare for his water for ablution and so on. This Jewish fellow was not a, was not a Muslim. There is, there is a, there is a, well, I couldn't find the, the, the hadith. Oh yeah. Another book. 
Dah berat lor buk. Yes. Anas bin Malik radhiyallahu an narrated a Jewish boy used to serve the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and became ill. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to pay him a visit and said to him, "Embrace Islam." Actually, what actually happened? The Jew, the Jewish boy, was with his father. Of course, both of them were not Muslim. But because the Jewish boy was so close to the Prophet because he used to help the Prophet prepare the water for ablution at night and so on. So because of that, he was close to the Prophet. The Prophet felt close to him. So he visited him and asked him to embrace Islam because he was about to die. Asked him to embrace Islam. Just say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashadu anna ka Rasulullah. Then the boy looked at his father. You know, the boy looked at his father and still not knowing whether he's going to say it or not. Then the Prophet repeated. I think it was at least the third time. Then he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna ka Rasulullah. And he died. You know what the Prophet said? Alhamdulillah. I have saved one life. I have saved one life. Is that, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that it is not just your relatives that you visit. You visit almost every day. You will seek. Okay? But of course, if this were to be followed strictly, then every sick person there will be BQ. Everybody wants to go. I think we have to be reasonable. <laughs> if there is a person who is sick in Singapore, everybody goes to Singapore. No, no. Right? What is convenient for us? Okay. Your neighbors definitely will. Okay. Now, next one, what is the reward for visiting the sick? There are so many hadith regarding the reward. Okay? Let me go through some of them at least. Okay. The first hadith. Narrated Aisha, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah's apostle, Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "No calamity befalls Muslim, but that Allah has created some of his sins because of it. Even though it were the trick, it, it were the trick he received from a thorn, right? A trick by, from the thorn. Even that, Allah will expiate your sin." So that is the reward. Right? That is the reward. But be careful. If you are sick, you don't start complaining. If you don't, if you don't accept the illness that befall upon you readily, then of course you don't get that <laughs> the reward. Yeah. So you have to accept the illness readily. Reba. Right? Secondly, narrated Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and Abu Hurairah. The Prophet sallallahu said, No fatigue, no disease, no sorrow, no sadness, no hurt, no distress befalls the Muslim. In other words, no calamity, no calamity befalls the Muslim. Even if it were the prick that he receives from a thorn, but that Allah has created some of his sins for that. Third hadith that I want to read. There are so many more. Allah's apostle said from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. This is very interesting. The example of a believer is that of a fresh tender plant. A fresh tender plant. From whatever direction the wind blows, it bends. 
in that direction. But when the wind becomes quiet, it becomes straight again. Similarly, a believer is afflicted with calamities, but he remains patient till Allah removes his difficulties. In other words, we must readily accept the calamity that we are being tried upon. And an impious, wicked person is like a pine tree which keeps hard and straight till Allah cuts or breaks it down when he wishes. In other words, if it is a pine tree, if it is a very big wind, it will break. So he will get nothing. In other words, for a Muslim, you have to be prepared to accept whatever calamity that falls upon you, because you know very well that that calamity is one source of making an expiation of your sin. It's very, very important. Next one. Narrated Abdullah sallallahu uh, I visited the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during his ailment. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was ill and he was suffering from a very high fever. I said, "This is Abdullah ibn Abbas. You have a high fever. Is it because you will have a double reward for it? You have a very high fever because it is higher than normal people, normal person." In fact, Siti Aisha radiallahu anha was explained in one hadith that I've never seen a man who is suffering so much as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that the Prophet, his strength is equivalent to 40 normal human, normal men, right? So, in this case, he said, is it because you will have a double reward for it? In other words, you have a very high fever. Is it because you will have a double reward for it? He said, yes. Prophet said, yes. But, uh, yes. For no Muslim is afflicted with any harm, but that Allah will remove his things as the leaves of a tree fall down. Yes, very clear. Next one. This is similar hadith, but slightly different. Eh? Again, narrated by Abdullah, Rasulullah an, I visited Allah's Prophet, Allah's Apostle, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while he was suffering from a very high fever. I said, Oh Allah's Apostle, you have a very high fever. He said, Yes, I have as much fever as two men of you. Double. I said, Is it because you will have a double reward? He said, Yes. No Muslim is afflicted with any harm, even if it were the trick of the corn, but that Allah is the sin because of that as a three which has been very similar. Okay. So I think that's about all that I want to read about the reward. Basically the reward is expiation of sins. Now how about praying for the sick? How about praying for the sick? This I pick up another hadith from an nawawi Just now was from Bukhari. This is from an nawawi Interesting hadith. Abu Sa'id al-Qudri radiallahu anhu thought Jibreel came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "O oh Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do you feel sick?" He said, "Yes." So Jibreel asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Are you are you sick?" He said, "Yes, I'm sick." So what did Jibreel do? Jibreel supplicated as follows: He performed the rukya, in other words, he made some dua. Bismillahi arqita min kulli shay'in yudhika min sharri kulli nafsin aw aynin min hasidin Allahu yasika bismillahi arqita So this is the dua that he prayed uh, supplicated for the Prophet Allah. What is the meaning? With the name of Allah I recite over you to cleanse you from all that troubles you and from every harmful mischief 
and from the evil of the eyes of an envier. Allah will cure you and with the name of Allah I recite over you. This is the hadith of you. There was, I read somewhere, it says that, you know, for someone to recite some verses of the Quran and blow into the water, right? You have a glass of water or a bottle of water, then you blow into the water and then let the person uh, drink or whatever. Right? It seems blowing into the water is not allowed. I read somewhere it's not allowed, but I, I do not believe that. <laughs> I do not think so. But I purposely started with the hadith on the ruqyah given by Jibreel himself on the Prophet In other words, it's so authentic too, that you don't have any doubt that you should be able to do it. Okay? And then, there are so many other hadith uh, with regards to what what of prayers we should recite for the for the for the sick people, right? For example, from An Nawawi, An Nawawi, Hadith 321. Aisha report Aisha radhiyallahu anha reported when the Prophet sallallahu visited an ailing member of his family, he would touch the sick person with his right hand and would supplicate, Allahumma rabban nas, adhibil basa. Wasfi anta shafi la shifa'a illa shifa'uka shifa'a la yugadu sakana. Very famous dua. Right? Allahumma rabban nas. Allahumma rabban nas. Adhibil ba'sa wasfi anta shafi la shifa'a illa shifa'uka shifa'a la yugadu sakana. Allah, the Rabb of mankind, remove this disease and cure him or her. You are the great curer. There is no cure but through you. It leaves behind no disease. This is from Bukhari and Muslim. So you can use this particular dua when you visit the sick. Or when somebody is sick. When your child or whatever is sick, you can use this dua. Right? Another hadith, it says, Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Radullah and the the Prophet said, He who visits a sick person who is not on the point of death, then there is no sound that he is going to be, there is going to be dead, there is going to die, right? And supplicate seven times the following. As'alullah al-Azima, Rabb al-Arsh al-Azim, an yashfita. أن يشفيك أسأل الله العظيم رب رب العرش العظيم أن يشفيك seven times that is also another dua that you can give and there are so many others I just give to you so that you know that there are ways and means of actually what you call make supplication for the sick so that his sickness is being reduced or is being cured. Right. The problem with us, when we are sick, we go to the doctor. When we go to the doctor, the doctor gives you the medicine. You go back and take the medicine and you feel so relieved, so confident by taking the Panadol or the whatever, you feel that you will be cured. Right? And you forget that the one who cures you is not the tablet, is not the Panadol, but it's Allah. That is just the ikhtiar, that is just the effort that you make. There was one time when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam had a toothache. So he asked God, because Musa alayhi salam could speak to Allah directly, so he asked Allah, Oh Allah, I've got this problem with my tooth, I don't know what it is. Can you please help me? How can I remove this difficulty? So Allah says, you go to such and such a place, there is a tree. You take a few leaves of the tree, you put in water, and drink the water. Inshallah, you will be cured. So he went to the place, he found the tree, he took a few leaves, put in the water, drink it, it was cured. 
six months later, he got the same problem. This time he knew what to do. Because he had done it before. So he went to the same tree, took a few leaves, put in water and drink, but he was not cured. So he asked Allah, why? Because I did exactly what I did before. You forgot. It is not the leaves or the water that cures you. It is me who cured you. Last time you asked for my permission. This time you never asked for my permission. Don't forget. It is not the leaves, it is not the water, it is me. Very good example. So we have, I feel the same way, you know. When I go to the doctor, I feel so confident after taking all the medicine, I go back and you know, follow the medicine, oh, I think I'll be alright. Take the Panadol after three months, after three hours, your temperature will go down. You forgot. You forgot that it was Allah who cured you. This is something that we have to learn, to practice. That is something that you have to do, but the person who chose it or the one who chose it is Allah. Now, the next one is the length of the visit. Interesting. How long should we visit the sick? Whether it is in hospital or at home, according to one one host, he says the length of time between two khutbah of Jum'ah, between the first and the second khutbah of Jum'ah. How long is that? Maybe one minute. The first and second khutbah, yeah, so of Rubah, so of Rubah, so of Rubah, but one minute. Of course, that probably is one, one, one opinion. But what it says, what normally it is, you have, you should not stay too long. You should not stay too long. Make your visit brief. Six persons may not withstand such long visits, may not like such long visits. Especially certain people, when they are sick, they don't look proper. You don't like people to come and see them in that situation. That is why sometimes the sick person will say, please don't come. Please don't come visit me because I'm not in that situation where I can receive that. Physically. So, that's one. But we have to go and see him. So, most important is make it brief. The length of the visit should not be longer than the time between the two khutbah of Friday. About one or two minutes. In this respect, it was said that the visit should be long enough to convey your greeting and wishes, salam, to ask the sick how he is or how he or she is doing, to pray for recovery and to leave immediately after saying goodbye. Don't try to stay too long. Unless he is very close to you, maybe your father, or your wife, your husband, whatever, or your own son, your own daughter, that's different. Okay? That you may stay longer because they want you to be there. When the sick person wants you to be there, yes, but when he doesn't want you, better not. So, if you visit a patient, uh, a sick person, say your greeting, and immediately you should say goodbye. The best visit is every third day, not every other day. That's the best. The best day is in the blink of an eye. The best day is also the better. So do not bother the patient with many questions. Do not ask him to do it. Two or three words will get you along. At the end of his book of Malachi Specs, Al-Kafi Imam Ibn Abdul Bar said, whether you visit a healthy or an ill person, you ought to visit where you are told. Where you are told. You ought to sit where you are told. Now you cannot just sit anywhere you like. Even when you visit a house, for example, you should sit where you are told to sit. 
there might be some seats which are reserved for certain people in the house. He doesn't like people to sit in his own chair, in his own seat, right? So he will tell you where to sit. So that's also an, one of the manners of visiting people. Unless they are close friends. So you should not to sit, uh, you should not visit too long unless they are close friends and the ill person enjoys their company. Then, otherwise, you should very well. The visitor ought to wear clean clothes with a fresh scent in order to make the, the, the sick person feel better, both spiritually and physically. At the same time, it is improper to wear fancy clothes that are more appropriate for parties and festivities. Don't wear football jersey or something. If you want to go and play football, it's fine. Wear still, wear still too. Wearing a strong perfume may annoy the person. Visitors ought to keep their conversation light and avoid gloomy talk that might exacerbate the patient's distress. Don't go and tell him, no, so and so just died. <laughs> so and so just died. How did he die? You are visiting a cancer person. Oh, he died of cancer. Cancer of what? Don't do that. Eh? Don't give him bad news. Give him good news. Avoid conveying bad news such as a failing business, a death, or similar bad news. Also, visitors ought not to inquire about the details of illness. What type of sickness do you have? How long have you been here? What type of medicine have they been giving you? Have, how many pints of blood have been transmitted to you? Yeah, don't ask all that. Unless the visitor is a specialized physician. That's a doctor yourself. Maybe you can ask certain details. Similarly, visitors should not recommend to a patient any food or medicine that might help, that might have helped them or someone else. Such recommendation might lead the ill person out of ignorance or depression, pride, or further complication or even death. Right? Don't try to, to, to recommend any kind of food or... Because there was... Just now I saw one... Uh, one... Uh, what do you call YouTube? It seems that uh, some people have been taking uh, uh, vinegar as medicine. Vinegar uh, from uh, dates. Vinegar of the dates or vinegar of the apple, right? As medicine. And this doctor was saying there is no relationship between vinegar and what they call heart problem or cholesterol. No such relationship at all. No scientific evidence at all. So he, he cited two cases, one fellow, an elderly, elderly person, he came and he said he got some burning sensation in his uh, chest. So he thought it is some problem with the heart. So the doctor is a heart specialist, he was trying to take all the tests and said, nothing is wrong with your, test, with your heart. But I do not know what this is. Then just before he left, he said, I've been taking some uh, vinegar. Then uh, he said, oh, oh, oh. Then he said, why don't we stop the vinegar? After two weeks, he come back. So two weeks later, he came back, he said, I'm fine now. After not taking the vinegar for two weeks. So it's the vinegar that burns the esophagus. Huh? So don't try to. In fact, my late father, somebody in the family, uh, recommended vinegar to him. My late father. One day he was telling me that he's very, very sick. He wants me to go to bring him to hospital. And I was in the gym, he said, Drive faster, drive faster. <laughs> you know, then I told him, don't take this. So he was taking you know, religiously, every day, one tablespoon. And it was burning with his hmm? So, please, just because it is from the date, yeah, vinegar of the date, you take it. No, no. Take the date, is okay, but not vinegar from the date. Do not criticize or object to the treatment of by the physician in the presence of the ill person, for it might cast doubt in the mind of the sick. 
if you are a specialized physician, you may want to discuss the case and it's written privately with the doctor in charge. Not in front of the sick person. Okay? So, those are the manners that you ought to observe when you visit the sick person. Now, the other thing is, how should the sick person, if you are sick, for example, how should you express your sickness? Yeah? Because you should express it in a way that shows that you are ready to accept. So, how do you do it? So, it is recommended that when asked about our condition, the sick person should start by thanking Allah, by saying, Alhamdulillah. Right? And then proceed to list his complaints. You can say, Alhamdulillah, but I have some problem with my nose, some problem with my ear, some problem with my eye, whatever. Right? But you must start with Alhamdulillah. Okay? And proceed to list your complaints. This is to avoid the appearance of complaining of Allah's spirit. This was the etiquette of the followers as reported by al khatib al-Baghdadi in the Tariq Badad in the biography of Abdurrahman al-Tabib. Rahman al-Tabib, Abdurrahman is a doctor in his biography. Who was the physician of Imam Ahmad and Bishr al hafiz to two colleagues, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Abdul Rahman said, both Imam Ahmad and Bishr became sick and were treated at the same place, in the same office. Right? So this is a story, real story. Right? Imam Ahmad and his friend Bishr were sick in the same time, at the same place. So Abdul Rahman was supposed to look after them because he was the doctor. So what happened? When I visited Bishr, when Abdul Rahman visited Bishr, I asked how he felt. And with thanks to Allah first, he says, Allah, Alhamdulillah first, he then proceeded saying, I have this pain or that complaint. When I visited Imam Ahmad and asked how he felt, he would say, I feel alright. I didn't say Alhamdulillah, I feel alright. One day I told him, your brother Bishr is also ill. But when I ask him of his condition, he thanks Allah first, then tells me his condition. Then Imam Ahmad said, please ask him, from where did he get this? Where is the dalil? The Imam said, Alhamdulillah first. I answered, that means Abdul Rahman said, his presence makes me reluctant to ask. In other words, the presence of Imam Ahmad himself makes him reluctant to ask Bishr. But anyway, so Imam Ahmad said, tell him, your brother Abu Abdullah asked from where did he get this? In other words, Imam Ahmad told Abu Rahman, go and tell Bishr, your brother Abu Abdullah wants to know where you get this particular method of explaining your difficulty. Abu Rahman asked Bishr a story. Bishr said, Abu Abdullah wants everything with authority. I heard this from Azhar, who heard it from Ibn Aun, who heard it from Ibn Sirin. If a person thanks Allah before complaining, it will not be a complaint, but as if telling the acts of Allah. That's how we should answer. I told this to Imam Ahmad. After that, if I asked how he felt, he would start by thanking Allah and then describing his mistake. Right. So that's the way it's supposed to be done. But we always forget to say Alhamdulillah. The answer of Bishr indicates that when asked about their health, the sick preferably should praise Allah first, then explain their complaining. But this approach is not considered complaining against the acts of Allah. Okay? Now, now, in fact, the, the, the text that I have from the book is gone, it's finished, yeah? But I have got some other things that I'd like to share with you. The Prophet orders. 
prophet made certain orders that we should follow. Okay? And I purposely took a few. Number one, from the hadith 552, narrated Abu Musa al-Ashari, radiyallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said three things: feed the hungry, visit the sick, and set free the captives. I repeat: number one, feed the hungry, visit the sick, and set free the captives. We didn't have to set free the captives because we don't have captives anymore. So anyway, you have to feed the hungry and visit the sick. These acts, right? Have tremendous reward. I'm telling you, tremendous reward for people who feed other people. Tremendous reward for people to visit the sick. That's tremendous. You don't take it lightly. Another one. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam narrated Al Barrah ibn Aqib. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered us to do seven things and forbade us to do seven other things. And what are the seven things that he ordered us to do? And what are the seven things that he prohibited us to do? The first one is it the sick. One, the first of the seven. Number one is visit the sick. Number two, follow the funeral procession. Follow funeral procession right up to the grave, not just up to the mosque. Many of us do up to the mosque. We don't normally go to the grave. Not everyone goes to the grave, but we should go to the grave. Number three, bless the sneezer. In other words, somebody. Sneeze. When you sneeze, what do you say? Alhamdulillah. Right. So if you hear somebody sneezing and he says Alhamdulillah, then you should bless him by saying Yarham Allah or Yarham Allah. Yarham Allah or Yarham Allah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. When he says Alhamdulillah, he says Yarham Allah. Then for him, he can actually say another thing. What is it? يهديكم الله ويصلح بالكم. يهديكم الله ويصلح بالكم. These small small things, you never know what the reward is. You never know what the reward is. There was a man who has done all sorts of sins. Name it, he has done it. When he was about to die. He told his children, he told his son, "You know, I want you to burn me when I die, because he knew that when all of us have died, there is one part of our body which is the 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 the, the bone at the back will be that will never be destroyed." That will be there, and Allah will pour rain onto the all the place, and from here the human being will actually die. So he thought, if I were to get burnt, you know, if my body is being completely burnt, then even that bone will be burnt. So I will not reappear later on. So of course he reappeared. When he reappeared, Allah asked him, "Why did you ask your son to bury me, to burn me?" So he explained. He, said, he was so afraid because he has done, done so much sin. He was so afraid that he will go to Nar for sure. So in order to escape that, he wants to disappear completely by getting himself burnt. So what is it now? Oh, because you were afraid of the Nar. I put you in that. Why? You can never tell, but don't try it. 
there was a merchant. He was not, I mean, he, he was an ordinary person. Ordinary person. Every night, he will do his accounts. One day, while doing his account, he was using, you know, that pen where you uh, put the ink, right? And put the ink and then write. Put your pen inside the ink bottle and then... So, as he put inside the ink, and he was about to write, a fly came and landed right on the ink. And the fly was actually drinking the ink. And he saw the fly drinking the ink, he felt so pitiful. So he allowed the fly to drink until the whole thing dried. And then the fly went away. So when he was there, Allah asked him, What is it that you have done in the world that you were most sincere? He thought and thought, he said, The only thing I was really sincere was when I allowed the fly to drink. The ink. Because of that, you did that. If you say Alhamdulillah 100 times before sunrise and 100 times before sunset, in other words, before Suruk and before Maghrib, 100, 100. It is equivalent, the reward is equivalent to. Giving away 100 horses for the battle, complete with the battle, what is it? No armaments. Complete. In other words, 100 in the morning, 100 in the afternoon. See, Alhamdulillah, 100 times is how many minutes? 3 minutes. That is the reward. If you recite Ayatul Kursi, Consistently, after every prayer, in other words, after every obligatory prayer, after every obligatory prayer, you recite Ayatul Kursi without miss. The Prophet said in a hadith, if you do that, the only thing that will stop you from entering Jannah is death. The only thing that will stop you from entering Jannah is death. Not so difficult to do. But the reward is so huge. That is why I said, visit the city. The reward is so big. It's not so big. Okay? That's number one. Number two, follow, follow the funeral. Number three, bless the Caesar. Number four, accept invitation. Invitation for the wedding, invitation for whatever. When you accept, you go. Don't accept and don't go. Don't say, Inshallah, I never go. Number five, greet others, greet everybody, say salam to everybody. Say salam to everybody. This is what the Prophet asked us to do. Number six, number six help the oppressed. Help people who are oppressed. Today, I think there are so much opportunity for us to help oppressed people. The Rohingya, the Syrian, the Yemeni, all sorts of people, even some, some Muslims in this country. Number seven, help others fulfill their oath. Help others fulfill their oath, their obligation, including the debt. If they are in debt, if you can fulfill that, if you can help them clear the debt, then that. What are the prohibited things? Number one, to wear gold rings. This is for men. Not for ladies, yeah? You want to wear gold rings. Number two, to drink from silver utensils. This is for both. None of us should be drinking from silver utensils. Utensils made of silver. Number three, to use mayasir. What is mayasir? Mayasir is silk carpets placed on saddles of horses or on mules or donkeys and so on. Right? The silk, uh, what you call carpets, that you use as saddles. Number four, to wear al-qisya. Al-qisya is linen clothes containing silk 
from easy, very fast. So this the word is kind of in and close, containing self from easy. Number five, we use istibrak. Istibrak is another kind of self, very thick kind of self. Number six, to wear dibaj. Dibaj is another kind of self. So different names of self or different types of self or different categories of self are given different names. And finally, not to wear self. So those are the seven. Actually, out of the seven, four are things that have to do with self. That has to do with to avoid self altogether. Now, let me read another hadith before I conclude. This is the, the 40 hadith of an nawawi hadith number 36. Very interesting. I think it's very important. Just to remind us, whosoever, this is on the authority of Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, is the Prophet, that the Prophet Wasallam said, whoever removes a worldly grief, from a believer. In other words, whoever eases a difficulty from a believer. A believer has some kind of difficulty, you ease it. Or you remove that difficulty from him. Allah will remove from him one of the griefs of the day of death. So for every time you remove the grief of another person, Allah will remove your grief in the day of death. Very important. We do not know what sort of grief that we shall have in the day of death. Whosoever alleviates the lot of a needy person, Allah will alleviate his lot in this world and the next. In other words, if you help a poor person, right, then Allah will help you in this world as well as in the hereafter. Whosoever shields a Muslim, and will protect a Muslim. Allah will shield him in this world and the next. Allah will aid a servant of his so long as the servant aids his brother. If you help your brother, Allah will help you. Whoever follows a path to seek knowledge therein, Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. I mean here also is a path to paradise. No people gather together in one of the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah and studying it among themselves without tranquility descending upon them, mercy enveloping them, the angels surrounding them, and Allah making mention of them amongst those who are with him. Whosoever is slowed down by his actions will not be hastened forward by his lining. What it means, the last sentence is that if you are not one of those who go to the mosque, you know, and so on, then whatever nobility in your lineage is, you not help. Right? You may be a prince, you may be anything, nothing will help you. Right? So that's one hadith which I think is important. Then I'd like to share with you the story of Moses again. Musa alayhi salam once asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it that I have done that pleases you most? Is it my prayers? Is it my fasting? Is it my, uh, what do you call my uh, prayers, fasting, then uh, my, my, my umrah, whatever? Allah says, you know, your prayers is only good for you. It's good for you. It doesn't please me much. Your fasting is good for you. It doesn't please me very much. And so on. Then what is it that pleases you? It pleases you when you help your brother. When you help your brother in any way, that is what pleases you. Because when you pay zakat, for example, it's for your own good. But when you give away 
part of whatever you have to others. You don't do it until you are very rich, then only you start giving. You don't wait. When you are not so well off, you can give, but not much. The most important is to give. The other thing that always strikes me is this. When you hear of some calamity, right? When those 23 kids were burned in, in Brahman, when you hear of a calamity, you feel like you know, in your heart you say, I want to give so much. I want to give X amount. At the time when you first hear the calamity, but when the time comes for you to write the chair or to actually give out the money, you have it. You have it. In other words, you discount fifty percent. You know, Allah will also discount you. <laughs> what you should have done was you should double it or give extra. Hmm. There was a story that I read this morning. A lady went to an egg farmer, a farmer selling eggs. So she asked, I think most of you have read this. She asked, how much is egg, one egg? She said, five rupees. Oh, can I have six eggs and I want to pay you only 25 rupees? She wants to count five, one, one egg three. Then he said, well, take whatever you want and pay whatever you want. Because you are the first customer that is buying the egg, and I hope this will be a good start for me. I haven't sold any egg yet. So she took the five, six eggs and paid 25 rupees, and then took a, drove a horse car, picked up a friend, and went to a very big restaurant, and ordered food as much as they like, ate very little, and left over so much. Then she went to pay, to pay the bill, it was 1,400 rupees. And she gave 1,500 and she gave Another person, an old man, he keeps on buying simple products from farmers and so on, vegetables, eggs, whatever. You know. Although sometimes he doesn't need these things, but he still buys. And most of the time he will pay extra. He would pay more than the price. Then the son who used to follow him asked him, why do you do this? He said, you know, the little that you give, the little extra that you give, means so much more to you than to us. Why don't you do this? This is charity wrapped in dignity. So from the two stories, you know what to do. But when we go to Pasamala, we haggle the price like hell. We haggle. Even if you can get a discount of five cents, you feel so happy. Allah, I feel so bad. Allah, I feel so bad. But when you go to the supermarket, you cannot haggle at all. You don't even check the price. Just take, 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 put inside the trolley and then pay, that's it. Why? Actually, it is the supermarket that you should haggle, and the farmer shouldn't haggle, you should pay more. I went to one particular stall in Tamantun, near Pasaraya. That one guy, he used to fry to food, food, I mean, uh, in Chakwe, and all that, you know. Fry and sell it. So it was hot when he sold it. It's very good business. But unfortunately, people started complaining. So he cannot fry anymore. He has to prepare everything from home. So it becomes quite cool. I used to buy from him. So I asked, How much is it? It's a way. It's a way. It's a Each. I asked for five, I said, Two fifty. Then I asked for one, one person, sixty cents. I said, Two, three seventy. I felt, why so cheap? I told him, why, why is so cheap? This is Taman Tun. <laughs> People can afford to pay, why is so cheap? You know? 
extra. He said, no, no, no. And I said, no, no, take it. <laughs> I feel so bad. I mean, this is the thing. Inshallah, that will be. I'm sharing not because I want to show what I've done, but I'm sharing because he's an example that probably is. You can afford it. What is 10 cents extra, 20 cents extra? Nothing to you. But to him, it's very, very great. Very, very great. So, with that, I don't have any jokes today. I have to, I have to stop. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.